Hello, I'm John Perry, and this is Representative Gary Glenn reports with Representative Gary Glenn. John, good to be back with you. Representative, good to see you. A uh, lot to talk about today. First off, though, let's talk about you. How are things going? Things are going good in terms of a health update. Uh, uh, prostate cancer is measured by a PSA test. When I was diagnosed in January, it was the 348 score. Anything over four is warning, and I was at 348. But it is held now for two months at 0 0.2. They tell me the cancer is gone. I'm in full remission. Uh, I am undergoing chemotherapy, according to the doctors, as an insurance policy against it ever coming back. Uh, and so there's a challenge there. Right now, the symptoms of the treatment are worse than the symptoms of the disease. And as I, th I know I've shared with you and I think our viewers, the tumor had climbed my spinal column and basically evaporated one of the, the vertebrae. Uh, but uh, that has healed sufficiently that the neurosurgeon says I don't need to wear the back brace anymore and it will heal without surgery. We thought we would have to have reconstructive surgery, but we're not going to have to do that. So uh, the underlying prognosis is the cancer has gone. We just want to pray that it stays gone. And I, uh, I noted former Congressman Dave Camp was in the news over the weekend because a Democratic candidate, Melissa Gilbert, the actress, pulled out of a congressional race citing inability to, f to have the physical ability to perform the job. And somebody noted that uh, Dave Camp had run for re-election while undergoing th chemotherapy. Well, so am I. I'm uh, undergoing chemotherapy till the end of July, uh, but am a candidate for re-election to the seat that uh, represents Bay and Midland counties. So uh, I got a lot of important, in the context of that, we, I mean, I bring up the health thing to assure our viewers of this. There's a lot going on. I haven't missed, uh, you know, by God's grace, uh, I haven't missed a committee meeting or a vote. I've got a perfect attendance record since January of 2014, and that includes being diagnosed with stage four cancer, radiation, chemotherapy. <laughs> And uh, it is my intention to continue to be on the job every day. And we've got some very important issues. I know we're going to open up with talking about energy, which is one of the most critical issues to employers in Midland County, uh, that it's going to be hot in the next several weeks before we break. And so I'm here on the job, swinging the bat, looking out for the best interests of my constituents. Let's talk about energy then. You're the vice chair of the House Energy Policy Committee. A lot of work was done on that issue in the House of Representatives <coughs> in 2015 and due in large part to some of the work that you've been doing that issue in the house has been you know, to a degree under discussion since we're seeing action right now though right. in the michigan senate in the senate even this week so in your judgment is that issue moving forward again and what's going to happen here in the mm -hmm. house well i was privileged to be given the opportunity by the speaker of the house kevin cotter because of how important this issue is to dow chemical and uh sem hemlock semiconductor Midland Co-Generation Venture, Dow Corning, asking to be named to be Vice Chairman of the House Energy Committee. The Chairman of the Energy Committee, who is in favor of legislation that is more of a monopoly type system, which I am opposed to, was able to get a bill out of the House Energy Committee back in November, but no action's been taken because there's not enough support for it in the Republican caucus. Uh, among those of us who believe that competition Free market principles, consumer choice are going to, be able to give us a better product at a better price, including for our electricity. It's such an important issue for Dow Chemical. It's the single biggest cost of doing business. It's an important issue for Midland Co-Generation Venture because they supply all of Dow's electricity and steam needs as long as they're able to be an, a viable operating entity uh, in, in Midland, which some of the changes in the energy legislation would threaten MCV and its ability to continue to provide electricity to Dow. If that were to be the case in the future, Dow would be forced to go back to consumers at as much as a 30% increase in electricity costs. And it's already the biggest uh, element of what it costs them to do business in, in manufacturing anyway. At that point, it puts them in the position of how they, they have very little financial choice, but to look to Tennessee or Texas where energy rates are cheaper. So Andrew Liveris said in a speech at the H Hotel last year, if you, wanna, if you want more of our manufacturing facilities to be put in Midland, not just our white collar executives, but our manufacturing facilities in the future to be in Midland and not in Houston or in Tennessee, give us more competitive energy rates, electricity rates. So I was named by the State Capitol Press Corps Freshman Legislator of the Year primarily because of what I was able to stop in 2015. And that was this juggernaut coming through the legislature, actually came out of the House Energy Committee, 
of legislation that would more monopolize the electricity market to the benefit of the utilities, take electricity choice savings to the tune of tens of millions of dollars from, from public schools, colleges and universities like Bay City Schools and Saginaw Valley State, who are in that 10% of the market who are allowed by law to choose an alternative energy supplier other than consumers energy, while schools like Midland or or Delta College or Northwood are prohibited by law from having the same savings. They're forced by law to have to buy their electricity at a higher rate from consumers. We were able to stop legislation that threatened to take that away, which the school said would force them to lay off teachers just to keep the lights on. So I got that freshman of the year recognition primarily for stopping that when the utilities had spent $2 million in TV ads, $800,000 in lobbying expenses, and $600,000 in contributions to candidates' campaigns, and we were still able to stop it. So it's been six months since the House Energy Committee passed the bill and no action on the floor because there's not the votes. This past week, the Senate Energy Committee passed out an even worse bill. It would not only threaten to take away electricity choice, it would not only threaten Midland Co-Generation Venture because it doesn't allow them to compete on an even basis with, with the utilities. They'd like to be able to competitively bid against consumers for new capacity, new plant uh, generation. But uh, this bill would not allow them to do that. And on top of all that, the Senate bill does something the House bill didn't. It phases out net metering, which is the basis on which people have a financial incentive to invest in solar energy like putting it on their roof with shingles made by, made by Dow Chemical, uh, for example. And the utilities actually wanted people who invested in putting solar shingles on their roof to have to sell the excess electricity, or the, the electricity they generate off the roof, to the utility at wholesale, and then buy it back from the utility at retail for their own use, which of course would eliminate any financial incentive in the development of, of solar energy. I've got uh, three business executives, uh, John Bartos, Steve Elbrecht, Ted Skinner in Midland, who put up, I don't know, maybe a decade ago what was at the time the biggest solar array in Michigan that was privately owned in Homer Township. Uh, this is a time when if we want a more secure energy market, if we want a lower priced energy market, we shouldn't be putting all our eggs in one basket in two monopolies in our area, consumers energy. We should be diversifying. We should have more competition, more consumer choice, uh, and products from which to choose and suppliers from which to choose. That'll bring the cost of electricity down. Free market principles say you got competition. Consumers are free to choose. You're going to get a better product at a better price. It'll not only make electricity cheaper, but it'll make it more secure so we're not reliant on just that one grid-generated supply. Uh, if, if people have got solar shingles on their roof, they may not, they won't be affected if the grid goes down because of terrorist attack or some kind of uh, weather um, e event. So I'm, if the Senate approves the uh, legislation that was just approved by the Senate uh, Energy Committee, I'm going to do everything I can to con con uh, persuade my House colleagues to reject that as they have so far, the House passed, Energy uh, Committee passed legislation. I'm, uh, I'm hoping that uh, Senator Jim Stamos, who represents Midland County, Senator Mike Shirky, who is the, the, the leading uh, voice for competition and free market principles on the House Energy Committee, I'm hoping they'll be able to stop it in the Senate. I'm going to talk to other senators and urge them to defeat it so that it doesn't come to the House. But uh, if it does, I'll be doing everything I can to defeat it there. And even though we're in May, almost June, there are only about 25 legislative days left between now and the end of the year. Now, six of those are in the last two weeks or first two weeks of December, the lame duck session, which I'm told all kinds of hokey pokey stuff goes on then. But we are getting to the point where it's possible we could just run out the clock and stop something bad from happening. Better we stop something bad and from happening. And the legislation happening. would die at the yeah, end of the year, whether it's right. House or Senate. Better we do nothing than to allow something bad uh, to be passed that further threatens Michigan jobs, not just the existing jobs like with Dow Chemical that might have to be relocated if they're forced to suddenly face a 30% increase in electricity costs, but our ability to be attractive and competitive in com competition with other states. We're currently 11th, 12th, 13th highest in the nation for electricity rates and highest in the Midwest. And the only time we've been below the national average and sometimes something other than highest in the Midwest 
was that time period from 2000 to 2008 when everybody in Michigan was free to choose uh, their electricity supplier. But in 2008, as we know, the utilities convinced the legislature to give them a 90% guarantee of market share and only 10% of consumers are allowed to choose to buy their electricity in our area from somebody other than consumers. So Bay City Schools saves 200000 a year. Saginaw Valley State saves 200000 a year because they got under the cap. Midland, Pinconning, Meridian Schools didn't. Delta didn't. Northwood didn't. So they're prohibited by law from experiencing those same kind of savings. I'd like to see, and in fact I've introduced legislation to say that every public school, every college and university would be free to buy from a cheaper supplier if they can find one. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping we can stop the bad stuff from happening, reshuffle the deck after the 2016 election. We'll have a new chairman of the Energy Committee. And I think that would, that would bring about a sea change in the direction, I believe, of the House Energy Committee if we can just stop the bad stuff in 2016 and have another shot at it in 2017. Because energy is, after all, as you point out here, a golden thread that runs through so many issues, education, industry. As you point out, and folks in your own district know very well right now, economic competition with other states and really the rest of the world too. Right. And we're undergoing a significant economic uh, change in Midland, in particular with the merger of Dow Corning and Dow, and then Dow and DuPont. And I've, I've been told that the end result of that is going to be that the facilities that remain in Midland is actually going to be more jobs than were there just under the old Dow chemical uh, mantle. But in the future, Andrew Liveris made clear, if you, you know, I think if I read between the lines, you don't have that much electricity cost to keep the lights on for the white collar executives. But for the electricity intensive manufacturing that goes on in Midland, and who knows, maybe we're, whether we're talking existing manufacturing or just future development. But he made it pretty clear, if you want those in Midland and not in Houston or somewhere in Tennessee with Tennessee Valley Authority electricity rates, we better have more competitive electricity rates in, in Michigan. And when we're highest in the Midwest and 12th or 13th highest in the nation, that's not competitive. And uh, my, my primary goal and where I have focused a lot of energy has been pursuing reforms that will give us a more diverse and competitive and thus lower cost electricity supply. And you're right, it uh, impacts not only our major employers, but our school districts. Uh, Clarkston schools in particular testified before the House Energy Committee that they save $350,000 a year in cheaper electricity costs. If they lost that, they'd have to lay off seven teachers, or excuse me, five teachers, they said. And that's just one example. Uh, an interesting development, too, there's an there's a international securities firm called UBS Securities. And Consumers Energy and Detroit Edison, the two major near monopoly utilities, hire this UBS company to market their stock to potential stock investors. In three of their last quarterly newsletters, they've predicted that this legislation we're talking about will eliminate electricity choice in Michigan. Now, when UBS Securities tells potential stockholders what they think is going to happen with legislation in Michigan, they're under the threat of pretty severe Securities and Exchange Commission penalties, fines and penalties, if they in any way mislead investors. And they say it will eliminate, they use the word terminate, electricity choice in Michigan. Meanwhile, the utility lobbyists are telling the legislature that it won't affect electricity choice. But they're under, they're under no threat of legal penalties for telling us it won't eliminate electricity choice, while the very stock marketing firm that consumers and DTE hires to market their stock to potential investors is under threat of SEC penalties on Wall Street, telling them that it will eliminate electricity choice and thus drive up the price of stock, the value of the stock, because more of the energy will be under a monopoly system where it's guaranteed, not just 90%, but they say eventually, all, they say it would wither on the vine, 90% of the choice market, which means you'd end up with 99 to 100% monopoly control of the utilities instead of just 90. I think in the end game, John, that everybody ought to be free to choose, but that's going to take a recasting of the, of the deck uh, between now and the next election, maybe an election after that, but that's going to continue to be a focus of my efforts here in Lansing. Representative, we will take a break right now. Okay.
And we're back with Representative Gary Glenn reports. Representative, the last time you we were here, we chatted a little bit about your work on the issue of Common Core. Since then, you've met with the House Speaker, Kevin Cotter, about that issue. I did, and I've, I've also talked to Representative Amanda Price, who's chairman of the House Education Committee, simply to ask that our legislation have a hearing. That's the first step in its consideration. Uh, let us address concerns and questions in a hearing and have the committee you know, weigh its uh, options and render its judgment. The uh, a senator, Senator Pat Colbeck, took my legislation, introduced exactly the same legislation in the Senate, and it's already passed the Senate Education Committee. So here's what the bill would do. It would eliminate the so-called Common Core educational standards, which are brand new and untested. There's no test data, no student performance to suggest that these standards are good or bad or more or less effective than what we've had before. Uh, I believe Michigan students deserve the best standards. I mean, if we want the best interest for our kids' futures, why not identify the standards that are proven by student performance on testing to be the best standards? As a conservative, I wouldn't have thought that would be the state of Massachusetts. But everybody, including business leaders for Michigan, which is a leading business uh, group voice in Michigan, uh, and the people who are concerned about Common Core all over the country have identified the Massachusetts standards pre-Common Core as the best for fourth grade reading, eighth grade math, and college and career readiness. So my legislation would eliminate the so-called Common Core standards that have been untested, replace them at a statewide basis at the state level with the Massachusetts standards which were tested and found to be best in the nation, but then still allow the local school districts like Meridian and Penn County and, and uh, Midland and Bay City Schools to, to change it as they saw fit at the local level, so restoring local control. And as I said, it's already passed the Senate Education Committee. Senator Colbeck thinks there are votes in the Senate to pass it. I think it would pass on the House floor as well because I have bipartisan support. In fact, I've got 33 co-sponsors. That's a third, roughly, of the House of Representatives, including Democrats. Uh, and so I think it would get bipartisan support on the floor of the House. I simply ask Speaker Cotter for the opportunity to have a hearing, have it considered by the committee. If the committee puts it out to the floor, let us have an opportunity to vote it up or down. I think it would pass. Uh, and it's one of the issues that has evoked the most uh, strongly emotional reaction. People are extremely concerned about this. Um, I, the president of the Pinconning Chamber, whose father was Congressman Traxler, Democrat, uh, from, from that area 20 or 30 years ago. And Harvey Santana, the Democrat state representative for, from uh, uh, Detroit that I've been privileged to have come up and, and hosted him and uh, went to a Loons game and did other things and showed him around Midland. Uh, he and uh, the president of the Penn County Chamber told the same story about their daughters coming home with a math problem based on Common Core and they had no clue about how to help them and felt frustrated because instead of a 3 plus 3 is 6, it takes like 10 steps to get to 3 plus 3 is 6. And that's just one of the concerns with it, uh, the data mining, intruding into the privacy of the student uh, and his parents' family kind of information and making this national database. Um, my bill would prohibit that as well, but the number one focus of the bill is to say our children deserve the best standards proven by test performance not standards that were imposed basically on the whole country by the federal government, bribing states with hundreds of millions of dollars if you'll adopt them. Even Massachusetts abandoned its best in the nation standards in return for hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government, from the Obama administration, and their student performance and testing has now started to taper off. It's on the ballot in Massachusetts this November a, a, an item on the ballot where voters will decide whether to return to the pre-Common Core standards in Massachusetts. I'm pretty confident that the voters of Massachusetts are going to return to what worked better instead of what has flatlined their student performance ratings. Uh, but I, I, I continue to believe Michigan students deserve the best, and that's the purpose of this legislation. And I'm hopeful sometime in the next several months we'll get a chance to have a vote on that in both the House and the Senate. Representative, in the last year and a half, you and I have talked quite a bit about how you talk to your constituents. Listen to them in your district, whether it's uh, an idea from a fire chief, whether it's visiting uh, a local executive, a local facility. You take those ideas and bring them back to Lansing. Uh, in terms of the fire chief, you know, that's something we've talked about before. In yeah. terms of legislation he, in essence, brought to you. What's going on with that? 
Well, Fire Chief Chris Coughlin was concerned about the representation the fire community had on the statewide committee that advised the building, for, came up with building codes. And he wanted more fire service representation, a higher number of representatives on that committee. Uh, the committee, uh, the Regulatory Reform Committee of the House, didn't want to add additional firefighter seats. But another thing Chief Coughlin wanted was to ensure that the one person from the fire service who was appointed to the building codes writing committee had some certification or background knowledge on building codes. Because everybody in the fire service doesn't know about building codes. They have other specialties, you know, hazmat and those kind of things. So you can end up with somebody who doesn't have building codes experience as the appointee. So what got unanimous bipartisan support? I had two Democrat legislators who were former firefighters come and testify in front of the committee on behalf of my bill. And it got unanimous bipartisan support last week to move on to the House floor to simply guarantee that the one person from the fire service who is on this building code commission is certified. There's actually a certification for having experience and knowledge on building codes. So it will require that future appointees from the fire service who are appointed by the state uh, fire marshal do have that certification for knowing what they're talking about in terms of building codes. The Home Builders Association was okay with this legislation. Uh, the fire service is okay with it. So that's where we were able to thread the needle and get unanimous bipartisan support. I would expect uh, if it goes to the floor and gets to a vote, it would probably pass unanimously because I know Chief Kaplan's concern was to make sure we're ha we have building codes that, are, that provide safety not only to homeowners and business occupants, but to the firefighters who have to go into these buildings if they're on fire and have some confidence uh, that they'll know how the building is going to react based on compliance with building codes. So that's a good example of, it's not a very sexy bill, it's kind of a mechanical type thing, but it's an important thing in terms of fire safety. It was a very high priority for Chief Coughlin. I'm proud to have been able to represent uh, his interests and get that bill, at least through committee so far, with strong bipartisan support. And I think it's one that can go all the way and be signed by the governor into law. On another topic, speaking of what you do back in the district, you stop by the Arnold Center. Talk to the folks there about um, what, in essence, <laughs> is a, a complicated issue. Uh, regarding minimum wage? Well, I, I met with uh, the board of directors of the Arnold Center and some of their investors from the foundations in, in Midland. Uh, Sid Allen, former president executive officer of the Midland Chamber of Commerce, who's on the board. And the situation is this. The Arnold Center employs about 200 disabled, physically and mentally disabled uh, adults who can perform menial tasks. And because of an exception in the federal minimum wage law, you could have three people, for example, paid to do the job that the minimum wage law would otherwise require be done by only one person. Some of the more abled disabled are lobbying in favor of requiring that all disabled receive the minimum wage law. The Arnold Center, which has operated and provided employment and meaningful employment and self-esteem right now for about 200 people, they've been in business for 50 years in Midland. And they say that if they were forced to pay minimum wage to their 200 people that they employ now, that they would, they would all lose their jobs because the sources of funding, it, it simply wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to have the contracts that they have with Dow Chemical for recycling, for example, or for other users who've contracted with the Arnold Center for tasks that they can do at least as cheaply or maybe more cheaply than the business could do it themselves and so they're contracting out to the Arnold Center to provide meaningful employment for 200 people who otherwise, in a, in a minimum, minimum wage environment, wouldn't be able to get a job at McDonald's or anything else. So you have some of the disabled who are saying we should get paid minimum wage. And if you resist that, you risk being characterized as anti-disabled. But the Arnold Center is concerned that the 200 people who would lose their jobs completely if they had to be paid minimum wage, that they're going to be the victims. It's similar. Because if you read the studies, anytime you increase the minimum wage, then entry-level employees don't get the jobs at all. It's an issue right now with McDonald's and fast food restaurants where they're, they're, be, they're able to actually put in robots that will pick your food up and deliver it to you out the drive-in window cheaper, $35,000 units, but cheaper over time than paying somebody uh, to do it. And so when the minimum wage goes up, it's the entry-level person who, who loses because they don't get employed at all, and it hits young black males hardest of all. They're, they're the ones who suffer the greatest loss of employment 
uh, anytime the minimum wage goes up. So this in a microcosm in the disabled community is just another example of where if, if we're all of a sudden required to pay minimum wage to a disabled person who's not capable of performing a function that the market would pay even the minimum wage would be out of work completely. And it's not just the income. I mean, they were telling me, and I talked to people who were working there, and some of the little menial things they did, I had a hard time catching on, but they were just whipping them out. It's not just the paycheck. It's the self-esteem that they're able to contribute to society. And so I was very sympathetic to their concern that, for example, Hillary Clinton has said as a candidate for president that she will eliminate this exception in the federal law and they're concerned that if that happens, you're going to have 200 people in Midland who are right now employed, making, a mo making money, feeling like they're making a contribution to their society, able to support themselves, who will be out of work and won't be able to find a job anywhere else because of their limited ability. So that was a very enlightening opportunity for my wife Annette and me to sit down with the board for lunch and, and hear about that. And I assured them that I would uh, be supportive of, of, a, of a wage regulatory environment where these 200 people would not be put out of work. Finally, Representative, folks are watching this program the week of Memorial Day, and we might see it as the start of summer, time for barbecues. The bottom line, though, it is a very solemn yep. and important day. And I, I think first of my father, who was a World War II Marine and also in Korea, who survived the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, I, I will, if I, we're taping this before Monday, Memorial Day, but by the time people see this, I anticipate that I will have spoken at the uh, Midland Memorial, veteran, Veterans Memorial downtown, and I'll participate in the Midland and Sanford Memorial Day parades uh, as well. That would be, you know, yesterday by the time this is on the air. Uh, and it's a, it's a sober, uh, you know, it started out as Remembrance Day after the Civil War, uh, but became Memorial Day, and it's a time to remember the sacrifices of those who've served our country in the military. I'm a member of the, the Veterans and Military Affairs Committee, uh, we're going to be having hearings over at the Veterans Home in Grand Rapids to look into these charges of abuse uh, and neglect, which now Attorney General Schutte is investigating for possible criminal penalties. I mean, the testimony we were getting in hearings earlier was sounded like a, like a POW camp uh, in some cases. And we were kind of skeptical to begin with, but by the end of the hearing, based on the testimony, we all signed a letter to Attorney General Schutte asking him to investigate. We're going over on June 13th and have a hearing at the home. And I also had a hearing on legislation uh, to require that at least one member of the National Guard be armed in every facility sufficient to defend themselves and their colleagues. And this was in the wake of the shootings at the, at the uh, recruiting centers down in Tennessee and the one at Fort uh, Hood, Texas. And I think we're going to see progress on that as well. Uh, we'll still tinker with the bill. But uh, as a veteran myself, I'm very conscious of and sim sensitive to to making sure that we keep our promises to the people who've defended our country. Okay. Representative Gary Glenn, thank you very John, much. John, thank you. Good talking to you. And I'm John Perry. Thank you.